We have been spending a lot of time trying to sort out everything that we use in the gardens before the growing season really starts. And there is a lot of stuff, probably too much, and that has been bothering me a bit. In a previous video, I've already talked about the insane number of seed packages that I've collected, a wide range of different types of propagation equipment we use, the different growing medium that we fill them with, the diversity of concentrated fertility and amendments we use to help the plants grow better in some of the gardens, and the large sheets of material we use to cover the ground and protect the crops. We don't need all of it to grow vegetables, of course, and I know that it's possible to grow vegetables with a lot less. But a big part of this Red Gardens project is to try out many different things, and each of the growing spaces relies on a different range of stuff to propagate, feed, and protect the vegetable plants. There are also a lot of other things that I have bought or acquired over the years to help grow more vegetables in the gardens, and a lot of stuff that I build and repurpose to make some of the tasks easier and more successful. And for this second video, I thought it would be interesting to focus mainly on the range of tools and equipment that we rely on in the gardens or have been experimenting with as a significant part of all of the stuff that we still need to sort, store and care for. There are, of course, a typical range of tools that many growers and gardeners in this part of the world have to help manage their growing spaces, including standard garden forks, spades, shovels, and rakes. And I have a collection of all of these, some of which I've bought, and others have been passed on to me, as these tools tend to last a long time, often longer than someone's enthusiasm for growing. It is generally only the wooden handles that need care and attention, and I've replaced a lot of handles, including the ones that I've broken myself and I still have some tools under the bench in the shed that need new handles. We also use other specialty rakes that are really useful for leveling beds and for clearing up the remains of plants on the soil surface. We have narrow shovels for digging and a wider shovel for moving lots of lighter bulk material. We have oscillating hoes and a few other types of hoes and cultivators for clearing the surface of the beds of weeds. There's also larger digging tools, heavier picks for clearing rough ground, and a fork that is beautifully designed for gathering hay that I also use for turning compost. There are lots of other tools that are designed for a particular task that I would like to try, though in many cases this task can still be done with the other more common tools that I already have, though perhaps not as easily or elegantly. The most recent addition to this collection of larger tools is a broad fork, which is also probably the most expensive tool I've bought. In the gardens where we still dig or cultivate the soil, we have usually used a long-handled garden fork and occasionally a spade to turn and gently till the soil. But it is much faster and easier to use a broad fork like this to loosen and gently cultivate the beds in some of the gardens, though I don't know what difference this will make to the soil and the crops in the long term. We tend to rely on the larger and longer handled tools in the gardens, but we still have some smaller hand tools, including old trowels and a dibber for making transplanting holes, and I think a few other small hand tools could make some jobs in the gardens easier. Of course, knives are essential, and I always have a general purpose knife on my belt when in the gardens, though with all the rough stuff I do with it, I am not great at keeping it sharp. There are a few small kitchen knives that we have found uh, in the community compost system, which we keep around as they're useful for some harvesting and weeding. We also have pruners or secateurs, which are good for harvesting squash or aubergines, and larger loppers or pruners that are useful for chopping up tough brassica stems in the compost. I also use a scythe quite a bit for clearing areas in the surrounding landscape, especially for collecting long grasses, nettles, and other biomass for sheet composting. And I use a sickle, which I find useful for cutting other fertility accumulating plants, such as comfrey. And we have a wide range of different sharpening stones, files, and a peening hammer and anvil for keeping all these sharp, which is an essential task and always makes things easier. We also keep some general purpose tools in the shed for use in the gardens, including a claw hammer, a mallet, fencing pliers, hand saws, and a hatchet. We also have measuring tapes and measuring sticks, which are useful to maintain an acceptable level of accuracy in the bed layout and plant spacing, which is an important part of the trials we do. Most of these smaller and larger tools we use as they are, but some of them have been adapted over the years, including putting longer handles on spades and garden forks, and sharpening the spades, which I have found makes them a lot more useful. 
I've also been making a few simple wire weeders out of thick wire and old bucket handles and have a collection of other bucket handles that I'm keeping for making the next ones. All of these tools need to be stored in a way that makes them easy to access and close to the gardens, but also kept out of the way and kept dry and secure, which is something I'm still working on. This is a bit tricky as we have two main growing spaces that are separated by more than 100 meters within a shared space that is publicly accessible. We don't use rototillers or other machines in the gardens, relying on only hand tools to cultivate the soil, haul material, and turn the compost, all of which can take a lot of work. I think this is an interesting example of the different biases or approaches that we can have around managing our gardens, accepting some things but avoiding others. For example, it's perhaps strange for some people that I'm willing to import a lot of fertility, but also hesitant to use fossil fuels or machines to make a lot of the tasks easier in the gardens. Part of this is to show that you can grow food without relying on machines, using a few simple tools and a bit of effort, but I still rely on energy and machines for other processes in supporting the gardens, which is perhaps a bit of a contradiction. I have a flame weeder that runs off of a propane tank that we use for creating sterile seed beds in some of the gardens, and that I also use for other purposes in and around the gardens. I regularly use a communal lawnmower to cut the grass around the gardens, both to keep the area tidy and under control, and to collect biomass for composting and mulching in the gardens. And I recently invested in a big chipper as a useful piece of machinery for processing the increasing amounts of woody material that can be gathered from the surrounding landscape, for adding to the compost and for use for mulching some of the garden beds and paths with wood chip. But I haven't really used it that much, partially because I haven't been able to store it close to the gardens, which makes it less useful and convenient, but I hope to resolve that storage and access issue soon. I also make use of a soil warming cable for helping to propagate plants for the gardens in the spring, protecting the tender plants from frost and helping them grow quickly when the weather is still cold. And I have quite a few grow lights that we use in our already warm house for starting seedlings. This propagation equipment relies on electricity at the house, and we still don't have an electricity supply up at the gardens yet, and if we did, I'd probably acquire some other tools and equipment that would make some of the processes easier in the gardens. Tools are obviously important in the gardens, but I also think that containers are essential in so many different ways. I used to rely mainly on repurposed containers, especially a load of buckets I got from a food factory quite a few years ago, which were great for many tasks in the gardens, including harvesting, washing, hauling compost, and general storage. But over the years, most of them have become too brittle and ended up cracking or breaking, probably faster than they would have if I had stored them out of the sun more often. With only a few left in usable condition, I have decided to invest in totes or larger containers, and in many ways these are easier and more useful, as they can hold a larger volume and I can purchase the sizes that suit the need. We use some to store various types of fertility that I buy in bulk quantities, which keep these supplies dry and out of the way, but I also rely on smaller repurposed containers for the convenience of spreading these amendments in the gardens. We use other totes for hauling compost and spreading it on the garden beds, though we generally don't fill them completely if the material is too wet and becomes too heavy. And we use other, more rigid totes for harvesting and carrying all the vegetables back to the house or to stock the honesty fridge. And I try to keep these ones clean and food safe. I also bought containers for storing small items that are useful for keeping close to the gardens. All of these totes and containers are an investment, something I probably wouldn't have made a few years ago. But I do think that they're really useful, especially with all the extra stuff that I need to store these days. Thankfully, the ones that aren't in use can be stacked together to take up less space when storing them. And I'm trying to keep these plastic containers out of the sun to prolong their life, though I have found that they're not indestructible. The other big investment in plastic stuff that I've made in the past few years has been watering systems. I used to rely entirely on hand watering, even in the polytunnel filling large repurposed tubs with water and using two watering cans to water all of the plants. This was a lot of work, especially in the dry periods that we can get in the summer, and installing other watering systems has possibly been the biggest time saving out of anything I've changed in the gardens. We still use the large tubs and watering cans for occasional watering and liquid feeding, and have them located for use in the three polytunnels, and we rely on uh, conventional hose and sprayers occasionally. 
but I've installed drip line pipes in all of the beds in the three polytunnels and have an additional sprinkler system in two of the polytunnels and plan to install sprinklers in the third polytunnel. I find the combination of these two watering systems to be quite useful, but at different times of the year, with the sprinklers watering the full surface, which is ideal when the polytunnels are filled with salad crops. And the drip lines are more useful when the tunnels are full of larger plants like tomatoes and beans, especially as they can get in the way of sprinklers and seem to do better when their leaves don't get wet. For the outside gardens, we have been relying on sprinklers set into a length of wood for the past few summers that we can move around the gardens, watering section after section of all the gardens to keep the plants happy during dry periods. But I have decided to set up drip lines on most of the outside gardens this year, which isn't really necessary here in Ireland, as we generally get a decent amount of rain for most of the season. But when it is dry, which seems to be happening more frequently, needing to regularly move the sprinklers during the day is an additional effort and time constraint, with a fair amount of water being lost to evaporation. So the plans to set up drip lines for watering at night with a timer is an investment and will require buying a fair amount of stuff, but there should be a lot less water loss and it will save a lot of time and reduce constraints at really busy times of the year. I'm also going to set up dripper systems for the huge numbers of large grow bags that are part of the different trials we are continuing with, which will save a lot of time watering, keep the plants a lot happier and remove a problematic variable from the trials that has been an issue this past year. All of this takes pipes, connectors, valves, hoses, adapters, drippers, sprinklers, and special tools, which is a lot of stuff to buy, assemble, manage, and take care of in the gardens. And I need to store the leftover lengths of pipes and surplus fittings. The other recent investment that I made is for hanging the climbing plants, especially for tomatoes and cucumbers, but also the aubergines or eggplants, peppers, and other taller plants in the polytunnels. I used to rely on recycled twine from straw bales or plastic builder's twine, but I've shifted to buying in big rolls of biodegradable twine that is made for this purpose. I also have invested in tomahawks or bent pieces of wire that the twine can be wound around, which are useful for dropping tomato and cucumber plants and extending the twine so that the vining plants can continue to grow. Using these hooks is a lot easier and faster than tying the twine and more secure, but it does leave me with a big pile of tomahawks to store when not in use over the winter, and these things can be a hassle to manage when they get tangled. This system works well with specially made clips that easily clip around the stem of the plant and hold onto the twine. These clips will apparently decompose in the compost, which can make the whole process of clearing the polytunnel at the end of the season a lot faster but we have been removing and reusing many of the clips to avoid waste and save a bit of money. But then they are another thing that we need to store over winter and have available for easy use during the growing season. All of this stuff is useful for growing vegetables and managing gardens, and in many ways is focused on saving time and growing better crops. I could definitely grow food with a lot less of this stuff, but saving time and finding efficient and effective ways of doing all the tasks in the gardens is important, especially for commercial growers, or for those of us with less time to spend in the gardens. But within the context of this Red Gardens project, I think it's useful to try out a lot of different things. And saving time means we have more time for other explorations. And as part of this project, I rely on another set of tools and equipment that I probably wouldn't use if I was just growing food for myself. We have several scales for weighing everything that we harvest, which is a key way of being able to compare different growing systems or fertility options. And I recently bought a couple of larger scales to move away from the cheaper and less reliable kitchen scales and hanging luggage scales that I relied on for years. And I have a few other pieces of equipment that could be useful for analysis, including thermometers, refractometers, and moisture meters, though all of these could be upgraded and made more use of. We also rely on our smartphones a lot to access the large spreadsheets for each of the gardens that serve as planting plans, task lists, and a place to record all of the harvests and make notes of any observations. I also use my phone for recording all of the clips for use in these videos and for recording myself. And I've bought several mics to improve the sound quality and of course need tripods as well as my laptop, hard drives, and all of the software to edit and store all of the videos. I am thinking of investing in lights and reflectors and another tripod for different situations and possibly another camera with changeable lenses to take better footage of the gardens. But I think that might be beyond the project's budget at the moment. 
These are all part of the ever-expanding collection of tools and equipment that I've bought or acquired for use in the gardens. And most of them are useful in different ways, and some of them are essential, but many of them are potentially interchangeable with a lot of overlap in function and use. And looking at it all, together with all of the material that I talked about in the previous video, and all of the stuff that I make, assemble, and repurpose, which will be the topic of the next video, it is a lot of stuff to buy, look after, and store. And sometimes I feel more like a consumer and user of food growing stuff than simply a grower of food.